the uh, issue before the Employment Relations Board and the issue that would be before the Oregon Court of Appeals concerns a statute in state law that is an exception to the usual arbitration process. As I mentioned, arbitration is usually a final and binding process. However, state law has an exception that says, as a condition of enforceability for an arbitration award, any award that orders the reinstatement of a public employee or otherwise relieves the public employee of responsibility for misconduct shall comply with public policy requirements as clearly defined in statutes or judicial decisions, including but not limited to policies regarding sexual harassment or sexual misconduct, unjustified and egregious use of physical or deadly force, and serious criminal misconduct related to work. Now, when we went back and looked at the legislative history that uh, surrounds this provision of the statute, we find that it was adopted in 1995 as a result in part of the decision, of an arbitration decision in the city of Portland invo involving Officer Douglas Erickson. Officer Erickson had been chasing a suspect and in the course of chasing a suspect had discharged his weapon approximately 20, 22 times. He was disciplined as a result of that conduct. The arbitrator relieved him of responsibility for that conduct. The arbitrator found he had not engaged in any misconduct at all, in fact, and relieved him and of the discipline that had been imposed. And when this matter went before the legislature, the sponsor of the measure, uh, that portion of the statute that I just read, which was Senator Neil Bryant, stood before the legislature and said that we are introducing this part of the statute to change the result in that Portland arbitration decision. That was in 1995. We come forward to today. We have a very similar situation. We have a police officer who was disciplined as a result of engaging in excessive force, and in this case, deadly force. We have an arbitration decision that again, relieve the officer of misconduct. And in fact, just like the Erickson decision, found that the officer had not engaged in any misconduct whatsoever. We believe that this statute applies in this situation. And that is the reason that we went forward to the Employment Relations Board and said, this arbitration decision should not uh, stand. That this is a condition of its enforceability and that it has to comply with policies regarding the use of physical or deadly force. The Employment Relations Board, and we presented this legislative history to the Employment Relations Board, and I think for the first time provided them with information that showed that what Senator Bryant was referring to was the very situation in Portland regarding Officer Erickson. I'm not sure if before they had known that Officer Erickson had been completely relieved of responsibility in that particular decision. Having presented them with that information, unfortunately, we did not receive a good decision. In fact, the Employment Relations Board restated the test that it had, that it has used for the last several years um, many years regarding this provision of the statute. It relied on Oregon case law, where Oregon cases had not considered that particular provision of the legislative history. Therefore, we think it's important, uh, not only as a matter in this case, but as a matter of general policy, to get this matter before the Oregon courts. As the Employment Relations Board acknowledged in its opinion, its legal test, its interpretation of this particular statute has never been considered by the Oregon Court of Appeals or the Oregon Supreme Court. It's not been accepted, it's not been rejected, but it's never been considered whatsoever. We need to get this in front of them so that they can take a fresh look at this statute, a fresh look at the legislative history and provide us with guidance. Um, I wanna... Uh if you don't mind, just take a moment to go over the facts of the case and then explain how I got to the place that I did to support what for me 
be in an unusual position to um, appeal, um, not just an arbitrator's decision, but now the Employment Relations Board decision, much uh, for the re uh, reasons in the past, as, uh, as uh, Will Hageson said in his testimony. Uh, I do believe uh, that a contract is a contract, but I also believe that there are um, times when a contract can actually violate a larger controlling law, which I have come to conclude in this case. Um, I think it's important to understand that when this incident occurred, um, the uh, officer in charge of the team, who was the sergeant, uh, actually considered it uh, such a uh, minor incident that at one point she considered disbanding the officers on the scene and uh, leaving Mr. Campbell uh, on his own. Um, unfortunately, she didn't do that, uh, and, and a um, negotiator um, persuaded Mr. Campbell to come out pursuant to his uh, direction. But before that happened, the incident commander, the sergeant, uh, had actually left the scene. And, and an incident like this, you have to have an incident commander, and it is uh, a violation of basic training protocol to leave the scene as the incident commander without appointing somebody else as the incident commander or the person in charge of the incident. That wasn't done. So when the negotiator asked Mr. Campbell to come out with his hand behind his head, he did exactly what he was told to do. He came out with his hand behind his head. However, that wasn't broadcast to other officers on the scene. So as Mr. Campbell walked out backwards, as instructed, he had his hands behind his head. However, other officers that had uh, shotgun beanbags uh, uh, at their disposal uh, told him to put his hands over his head. For a variety of reasons that I think many of us could, could imagine, uh, Mr. Campbell kept walking backwards with his hands behind his head, not over his head. As a result, they shot him multiple times uh, with beanbags. And he did what most any of us, uh, either there sitting in the audience or anywhere uh, listening uh, on uh, TV would do. He ran after being shot in the back with feedback for what must have been to him no reason at all. Uh, he was doing exactly what he was told. And that was the justification given for fatally shooting uh, Mr. Campbell in the back with an AR-15 rifle including in that instance, simultaneous with, uh, with Mr. Campbell uh, being shot in the back with the beanbags, another officer, a canine officer, had unleashed a dog to take down Mr. Campbell. Now, even that, to me, seemed to be an overreaction given Mr. Campbell was compliant with the hostage negotiator's instruction. But be that as it may, uh, Officer Frashar wasn't even aware a dog had been unleashed because, as a couple of your testifiers have stated, he removed his earpiece. He didn't know what was happening around him on the scene. Literally, the right hand did not know what the left hand was doing in this instance that should have been handled on a very low level and successfully. As a result, we have paid out as a city already $1.2 million to Mr. Campbell's family, included, uh, or in addition to that, the grand jury occurring testimony on the shooting took the, what I think uh, and there may be other examples, I don't recall uh, if there are, they took the unusual step of writing a letter in which, and this is a quote, they said they were outraged at the Portland Police Bureau's actions that led to Aaron Campbell's shooting death, a quote from their letter. And in my experience, in a nearly unprecedented, in fact, I, I don't think nearly unprecedented, just a flat, unprecedented statement by a top, uniformed Portland Police Bureau commander who said, after reviewing the sworn testimony by Portland Police Bureau officers from the arbitration, that he was sickened by what he heard. That what he heard in sworn testimony by some Portland Police Bureau training officers, kind of like a, and I quote here, refers to union story, unquote. The assistant chief said on the record that he was so upset by his training officer's testimony that he considered actually retiring from the Portland Police Bureau. I also want to make it clear, I spent most of my adult life defending the rights of working people, and not just as a union president, which I was for 12 years at the Portland Fire Bureau, but as a member of the Oregon State Senate, a member of the Oregon House, and I think whether my colleagues agree with me or not on issues I take, they would agree I've been pretty consistent, whether it's in, uh, it's in uh, executive sessions on collective bargaining, 
giving rise to a public session on um, the right to be organized or bargain collectively, uh, I have uh, uniformly and uh, maybe even at times to a fault defended the right of, of working people. And in spite of the facts of the Campbell case that I just went through, <laughs> I, I, I think that I will have to admit that I was stuck in the weeds of the technical aspect of Oregon Public Employee Collective Bargaining Act, commonly called uh, PECPA. The, and, and, and that being the law that this council uh, today, by our vote, uh, seeks to have interpreted differently by the Oregon Court of Appeals as it applies to this case. But it was the recent public comments by the Portland Police Association that that caused me to realize that there really is a bigger picture that I need to consider uh, in this case. When the PTA president ignores community outrage, unprecedented grand jury outrage, a $1.2 million settlement with Mr. Campbell's family for his wrongful death, and even ignores the unprecedented outrage expressed by the Portland Police Bureau's own top commanders, but instead makes outrageous personal attacks against the mayor and also against a highly respected former Portland Police Association president who testified that the shooting of Mr. Campbell was not consistent with PCC training. I felt like, as I do now, that I needed to change uh, my focus. And I think something needs to change uh, in the Portland Police Bureau. And maybe this is the path that we have to take to get there. And if that's the case, then so be it. And, and Mayor Adams, thank you uh, for your patience and uh, your leadership on this and uh, for doing something that I don't uh, often do, uh, persuading me to change my mind. Bye. Mr. Campbell's death has been tragic and um, heart wrenching for all of us and especially for his family. And I honor and acknowledge the courage, especially of Aaron's mom in urging us to continue pursuing this case. The cur her courage in keeping this wound open uh, in the course of the pursuit of justice is uh, very meaningful to me. And I, I thank the family for their support of this and Aaron's death was a stark reminder that we have had far too many tragedies involving people with mental illnesses in our community at 10 of the 12 while I've been on this council. And so yes, we need changes in mental health care and the mayor and I spent the morning with um, hospital providers and others looking at how can we fix our mental health care system which has been broken for many decades. And we will, we will indeed pursue that a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, we announced a new number that people can call if they're feeling suicidal or if their families are concerned about somebody who is suicidal. That number is a partnership with Lines for Life, a nonprofit partnership with healthcare professionals and volunteers who will take those calls and give advice and counseling for as long as it takes. And that number is 503 97 23456. So we encourage folks, if you are in a non-dangerous situation, to, to call that number. We will need to do policy changes. We will need to do training changes. And we have committed to doing that, $18 million for our new police training facility, a new training accountability committee to oversee what is done, the influence of the Office of Equity and Human Rights to look into how our officers are trained and who our officers are. All of those things should be done and will be done. The, of the Department of Justice report is very clear that the independent police review process is not working. And I will be looking to the auditor to, to, for her leadership on how we are going to make significant changes in that system. All of those de deficiencies will, must and will be corrected. We still need police accountability. When I was working as a nurse in a hospital, I had to follow the doctor's orders and I had to follow the hospital policies. I also had to act as a reasonably prudent nurse. And that is another standard of responsibility for the individual as well as following the institution's regulations. So as a city and a community, we must pursue all avenues, and we will. And still, the city council, the police commissioner, and the police chief must have disciplinary authority over the police bureau to promote, protect public safety and that of all police officers. State law provides that arbitration decisions are not final or binding if the award violates public policies. The Employment Relations Board decided to uphold the arbiter's decision based on its understanding of this state law. 
it, the ERB admits that Oregon courts have not considered or accepted that interpretation. This appeal asks them to do that. And it is imperative that we give Oregon courts the opportunity to clarify what is meant. I've also asked the mayor to um, put on the priority list for the legislative agenda in the 2013 legislative session a clarification. If the law isn't clear, let's not wait for the courts to rule. Let's clarify the law. I said last week when I announced that I would probably support this appeal that I would consider um, all the evidence at the hearing and that unless I heard compelling evidence to the contrary that I would be supporting this appeal. Everything I've heard today affirms that. I also met with Officer Darrell Turner and listened to his concerns. I still believe that this appeal is the right thing to do. Aye. Bish? Um, well, I'm sorry uh, Randy's not here uh, for me to uh, speak directly to him about his eloquent statement earlier uh, because um, much of what he said I not only agree with, but I thought the way in which he stated it was uh, very eloquent and extremely thoughtful. And I want to begin by just acknowledging that I think between Randy and me, we have both uh, been involved in labor relations for close to 50 years. So when Randy talks about some basic values that we share with our labor partners about uh, our belief in the uh, collective bargaining process and our um, general view towards uh, alternative dispute resolution, arbitration in general, and final and binding arbitration. R Randy, I think, said some very powerful things, which I agree with. That said, I think we have to be very clear at this hearing that this is not the action we're about to take, an attack on the collective bargaining process. And that's a diversion. This is not an attack on the collective bargaining process. And I think for anyone to suggest that this council has been somehow less than historically supportive of the rights of our employees to engage in lawful activity under state and federal law is missing the boat. Number two, I think it's important to say this is not an attack on the arbitral process. I practiced labor law for over 20 years, and I was involved in a number of cases where after an arbitrator's decision, either the union or management appealed the decision on either the ground that the arbitrator exceeded the scope of his or her authority or that the decision violated public policy. In fact, it is built into our process that even a decision which is final and binding can be challenged on very narrow grounds if the arbitrator did more than just get the facts wrong. And that is a safety valve which both management and unions in this state and city and across the country have historically used. So let's be clear, this is not an attack on arbitration. What this is, in my view, and I think Commissioner Fritz put it very well, this is a question of accountability. And there is a legal issue which we are gonna test in the Court of Appeals, and it has to do with the public policy exception. Like Randy, I was skeptical at first because having done this work for much of my adult life, I too am conditioned to see these exceptions in very narrow terms. But after talking to the city attorney and reviewing the law, I was persuaded that there is an important legal question that needs to be challenged at the next level. And as I said in my earlier statement, I recognize this is an uphill fight and I have no illusions about this. this we. we this is a tough fight, and it is quite possible we will lose at the next level. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take on this fight. And for those of us who believe that there was a fundamental defect in this arbitrator's decision, and for those of us who believe that it would be inappropriate to reinstate this officer, this is a lawful option that we have to contest this decision. So. After going through my own process, similar to Commissioner Leonard's, I too have concluded that this is the right step. And I will also say that I want to uh, uh, thank my mayor for the way he has handled this. He has been clear and consistent, and I too think some of the rhetoric has gotten way over the top. And we, we can disagree on things without personalizing our disagreements. In fact, that's what I've always found was the hallmark of successful labor relations. 
fact, I think it's one of the reasons Will Aitchison has been so successful for so long. But we should be very careful about not personalizing our, our, our disputes. We have a principled position we are taking today. I applaud the mayor for his strong leadership, and I vote aye. Saltzman? Aye. Adams? The irrefutable fact is the law was changed. The state law was changed in 2004 to deal with these exact situations. And for the past eight years, it's been missing in action from the entire process of, of uh, labor code, labor law. It's just as if it never happened. And that wasn't the intent of 04. The 04 law, if you read the transcripts by Senator Decker, it was very clear, compelling. Some of us were around at that time. It was passed to make a difference. It was passed to give local control back on specific and selected cases. The fact that it's been ignored and admittedly not tested in the courts is what we're trying to address here. The 04 law has been ignored, and it's time for the courts to decide whether the fact that it's been ignored is legal. I do not believe it is. I believe in local control. We don't have enough, and this is necessary to find out exactly who's right. I want to thank my colleagues on the city council for their willingness to engage on this issue. Uh, it's a very, very set of complex issues, and I want to uh, thank them for their support. I also want to underscore my support for Clay Neal in my office and uh, Sophia, uh, who are on the public safety team, and, and a, a big um, underscore of support for our city attorney, Jim Van Dyke. I really appreciate your work on this. Uh, we have a lot more work to do. Aye. So approved. We are adjourned.